everybody in this house tonight. And, Lord, we know beloved means your favorite ones, God. And, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, that you brought them into an environment, God, that they'll be able to grow. Grow in your presence. Grow in your glory, Heavenly Father. Lord, we didn't come for us tonight, God, but we come as kings and priests, God, to preach before you, to minister to you, God. You told your priests in the Old Testament to ne never let the fire on the altar go out. And, Lord, as priest, as the temple right now, you live inside of us. Your presence dwells in us, God. You're telling us the same thing. Sons and daughters, keep the fire burning. Never let the fire on your altar go out. So tonight, God, I ask, if there's a spark in somebody, God, if there's a spark in somebody, fill them, God, with your oil tonight and strike the match and let them burn. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all ready to worship in this place tonight? Come on, we serve a worthy king, amen.
Well, praise his name. Amen. It's good to be back in the basement. It's been a few years for me, but uh, we just got in from Pensacola, Florida, and, and God just moved last night. We were doing a men's event down there, and uh, man, we saw over 30 men get born again last night. Hey, God's still moving, guys. Amen. I will tell you something. I, I, I come weak. My voice is weak, but my spirit is strong. Amen. Because my God is alive. Amen. Let's, let's worship. Okay, tell I like bluegrass. <laughs> Don't ever let a piano player that, that was the Georgia State clogging champion for two years ever let them count a song in. It's gonna be real fast. Amen. Woo. I gotta get my breath. <laughs> And the high 
For y'all that don't uh, know us, I'm, I'm Chris McDaniel, and uh, I used to spend a little time playing with this country band called Confederate Railroad. Uh, before we got a record deal, I played for David Allen Coe and Johnny Paycheck. So pretty much if you got out of prison to play guitar, we became the band for you. But guys, I was a church kid. I grew up. I was saved at an early age, but I was not discipled yet. So when I got on the road, I was a virgin who had never drank, never smoked, never cussed. I didn't do what those people did. I got on the bus with my Bible thinking I could just keep that walk going on. But I want to tell you something. You get away from the presence of God and the environment of his people, you're putting yourself in a place of danger. I wasn't grown up enough to go out there and do it on my own. But guys, I fell to every pitfall that was out there. Uh, we ended up getting our record deal, sold six million records. I had Liza Minnelli step on my toe at the, at the Grammy Awards. And, man, I thought I was in high cotton. But the fact of the matter is I had a mask on. I was trying to hide all the broken parts of my life. I ended up with a $70,000 year cocaine addiction. And I was at the barn last night and I take my keys and I stick them in my nose and I swing them. And all the guys about fell out because they just finished eating a big steak dinner. They went, we're about to throw up right here on the table. You need to get your keys out your nose. But I want to tell you something, guys. Sin may look like fun for a season, but I want to tell you something. In the end, it will try to take your life because a thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But, but aren't you thankful there's a but? Because I, I finally hit the bottom, I hit the end of myself, and I woke up after a five-day binge with my face glued to the carpet in my house. And when I peeled my face from the ground, it sounded like Velcro ripping. And when I got up, I, we have eight, in the 80s and 90s, we had mirrors in our house, you know. In every closet you went to, we had to look good before we went out, you know. Now we got to look good for Jesus, amen. You know what the cool thing is? He says, come as you are, amen. So uh, I'm looking the best for Jesus right now, and uh, this is where I'm comfortable. Amen. But, um, man, I, uh, I didn't know what to do. I called my mama. And we had this number one song that said, Jesus is my father. He's good. And my mama came to my aid and brought my grandmother, who was the greatest prayer warrior I've ever known to this day. And my grandmother, all she did was get in the bed and pray Psalm 91 over her grandson over and over and over. And my friends, if you ever get in a place where you need protection, that is the prayer of protection. And my mother's a businesswoman. She gets me in the rehab, my third rehab. I didn't go for myself. Uh, the first two times, but this time I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I learned what the doctors had to say. And instead of going back to the pit, I decided to walk in the doors of a church. And when I walked in the doors of the church, they loved me the way I was. And I looked on stage, and guess what they had? The same thing we got tonight. They had a band in a church in 2000. And, man, I'd never seen that. I was like, oh, my goodness, they got a band. I wonder if they're hey, They can't be good in a church. And when they cut loose in worship, man, I was tore up out of frame. I'm talking about I squalled till my shirt was soaking wet. And then the man of God gets up and he's, he's like, well, the Lord changed my message this morning. And he said, I can't preach what I wrote 25 hours. He had notes and he walked back to this big throne chair. When I called his chair a throne chair, the chair was gone out of that church because there's only one who deserves the throne. His name is Jesus. And, and that pastor came up and he said, the Lord told me he is going to radically loosen me. Somebody clap for that. 
I don't know what that means for somebody. It may be a man, it may be a woman, it may be many people, but God has a word for you. And they prayed, and he said, I'm going to preach a message called Good Plans Are Mine. What's it going to be? And guys, he came out of Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. Verse 11, if you're in recovery like we are, we all know that. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. My plans are to prosper you. They're not to harm you. They're to give you a hope and a future. Now, I'm ADD. I had to break that down. I realized, well, my plans, I sold six million records. I got wards everywhere. I, 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 I played with everybody from George Jones to Leonard Skinner. Kenny Chestnut was my opening act. But when the end of it, when it came to, when I had to look at myself and say, well, wait a second, I'm too much for them to take me in. My fiance packed up and moved out. My friends won't take my call. I'm in a bad place. And man, reality set in. I missed verse 12 processing verse 11 and verse 13 come in. He said, if you'll seek me, you will find me. When you seek for me with all your heart, I will be found by you. I'll bring you out of captivity and I will restore your fortunes. Man, then he flipped to the prodigal son story and I realized that preacher was talking to me. And I want you to know if you're in here tonight and you feel hopeless and helpless, man, all you got to do is come to your son. Take a step back to the Father and He'll come running your way. And He will come running to cover every inadequacy you have in your life. Everything that's broken, He'll put a robe around it so the whole world don't have to see your broken soul. Only He can see your broken soul. Then He'll remind you who you are. He'll, he'll call you a son or a daughter. He'll put a ring on your hand. He'll put the bling bling on the thing thing. Amen. And, and, and then He puts sandals on His feet. And you know what? When you're directionless like me, you needed some direction in your life. And that's what the Father always has for us. He wants to give us His direction, His will, and His ways for our life. But we've got to surrender it each and every day. Amen. Oh, man, I, uh, I, uh, I sat there and listened to that message. And, man, they gave an invitation. And when I stood up, I was ready to run to Jesus. You know what? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he tried to shove everything between my ears down to my shoes. I felt like I had cement boots on. I felt like I had Signal Mountain in one shoe and Lookout Mountain in the other. John's Mountain hold my waist down. I couldn't move, and I bowed my head for the first time. And not a get-out-of-jail card thing. I, I just said, God, I commit the end of my sin. I commit my sin to you. I commit it to you. And God, if you'll help me, I'm asking for help, God. I'll give you every breath. I'll quit playing music. I'll do whatever you want me to do. But I need your help. And that's when God sent an 87-year-old lady over me, tapped me on the hand, say, honey, are you okay? I've heard you cry for an hour and 15 minutes. And, and I said, ma'am, I ain't been okay for a long time. I said, matter of fact, I'm in a really, really bad place because I've lost my fiance, my, my, my fame, my fortune. My, my, my friends don't take my call. My family's ashamed of me. I'm just in a bad place. And she said, honey. That's a lie straight from the pit of hell. Today, you're in the fixing place. You're up in God's hospital. And I want you to know Dr. Jesus is in here. His name's Jehovah Rapha. And I want you to know he's got the power to heal anything that's going on in your life. And I want you to know I believe God sent me over here to help you. You want some help? And I went, really? That's all I asked for. You ain't going to believe that. And she went, well, God sends help in funny packages, don't he, baby? <laughs> And she grabbed me by the hand, and I want you to know that was the greatest walk I ever took. It wasn't to win some award. It wasn't to play on a stage in front of 100,000 people. It was to go get my life right with Jesus Christ. And can I tell you what? He broke my chains, and I've been walking as a free man for 24 and a half years, declaring the glory of my God. Amen. Aren't you thankful for his amazing grace today? testimony song
Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Just a mention of his name. Everything can change. Everything can change. Jesus. Jesus. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. 
Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph And I'm singing my God will never fail Y'all believe that tonight? Well, my God will never fail Well, I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord Well, I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord There's power in the mighty name of Jesus And every war he wages he will win And I'm not backing down from any giant Cause I know how this story ends Yes, I know how this story ends Well, I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Well, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good flip the script Jesus you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good turn the page Lord you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good you turn it for good and for your glory Lord you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Let's take it up now You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good you take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good And I need you more I need you more than yesterday I need you more and More than words can say I need you more Than ever before I need you, Lord I need you, Lord. I need you more. I need you more than yesterday. I need you more. More than words can say. I need you more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you, Lord. More than the air I breathe. More than the song I sing, more than the next heartbeat. I need you more than anything. And Lord, as time goes by, I'll be by your side. Cause I never wanna go back to my old life. And I need you more. I need you more than yesterday. I need you more. More than words can say, I need you more than ever before. I need you, Lord. I need you, 
playbooks.
can stand against. That just kind of reverberated in my spirit. Nothing can stand against. Nothing. We were on, I had about a seven hour drive up. To get here, uh, I got to fight some traffic on the way. You know what that, that means? You get to get in the Word. I'm not going to read my Bible coming down the road, but I can listen to somebody else preach. Amen? And man, uh, I hooked on to a message that just got a hold of my spirit. And it was, uh, it was about the... Uh, and, and how, how they got healed by Jesus. But only one came back to thank him, to make room in their life, in their agenda. The others went back to their family going, look, I'm healed. Nothing else is going to fall off. I'm not going to fall apart anymore. But the one that went back and fell down and worshipped him, that made time for him, he was made whole. So I want to tell you something. There's something when we make time in our busy schedules and our agendas to get in his presence to thank him for everything he's done in our life. And I want to tell you something. I got a lot to be grateful for. I, I, I won't lie. Last night, I was mad. I backed into a tree and made a big old den in my truck. And you could hear me scream for about two miles away. Ah! But then God reminded me, hey, dude. You went to buy a trailer for your other sound system you just bought. And you were going to have to pay $8,000 for this trailer last Saturday. And you went and you shared what you were using it for. And the little dude walked back into his office and came back and said, Are you a nonprofit? I said, Yes, I am. He said, Can you write me a donation letter? I said, Yeah. I'm thinking, man, if I get this half price, I'm going to dance. I'm going to dance a jig if I can get it for $4,000. Praise the Lord. And he says, Okay. He said, Do you like this trailer right here? And I said, why do you want me to get this trailer? He said, because it's better made than everything else I got out there. It's got three-quarter inch feet. It's got five-eighths inch wood on the side. And he said, everything else got half-inch floors and one-eighth inch. It's got paneling for sides. And he said, so in other words, I want to give you the best thing I got. I said, wait a second. Did you just say you want to give me? He said, you heard exactly what I had to say. So in the midst of my little temper tantrum that I had for just a minute, God reminded me of who he is and what he does in our everyday occurrences. And sometimes we just need to make a little room, get out of our own head, get out of our own feelings, and just realize what he's done. He bankrupted heaven for me. He bankrupted heaven for you, my friend. And I pray tonight that not only as we do this last worship song, but you will make some room the word of God to penetrate your life because we've got a God anointed evangelist in this house. Yeah. Me and the band, we got to go to Delaware and do a, a tent crusade with about 2,500 people there every night with Frank Shelton. We've not grown to love and just uh, honor this man. He's been used all around the country on TVs, on stages, on platforms from the smallest church to the largest churches in America. God has used him. This guy's pre preached in front of hundreds of thousands of people at Stadium Crusade. I've not done that, but you know what I'm going to, amen? Because my God, if I'll make room for him, he'll make room for me, amen? Here is where I lay 
I'm coming back to the heart of worship when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you. I said it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Come on, if you're not standing, just go ahead and stand to your feet. As they can. Come on, what a mighty God we serve. I said, what a mighty God we serve. Wow. Come on, are you willing for him to shake up the ground of everything that's holding you back tonight? Come on, are you really, truly willing for him to shake up everything? Are you truly willing to give it all to him tonight? Wow. Listen, if it's your first time here, I know Pastor Ron's done welcomed you, but we want to welcome you to the basement. It's an honor and privilege to have you tonight. And listen, you're in a house of freedom. If you haven't already to been told, you, you can worship however you want to. We get wild and radical because he got wild and radical for us, okay? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, listen, we're going to take up the offering tonight before we bring forth the man of God. And they're going to throw, throw the ways you can give up on the screen here in just a, just a second. But listen, let me just tell you, you're, you're sowing into good ground. We don't receive a dime from you, okay? This goes straight into ministry and to bless the people around the world, and it goes into the kingdom, amen? Pastor Ron, don't take a paycheck. Me and my wife, don't take a paycheck. It's all about the kingdom. Amen. Amen. So listen, there's several ways. I know it's tiny. We're working. We just got our, our text to give back up or our cash app back up. So if there's, there's plenty of ways to give or if you want to give by cash or check, you can come to the basket or there's a little black box in the very back as you come in the door. You can give that way or you can do cash app, PayPal, or Venmo. And uh, listen, I, trust me, you're sowing into good ground. When these evangelists go around the world, you're going to be a part of it. Amen. We may can't go where they go, but we can sow into them. Amen. Amen. So with every hand lifted before we bring the man of God up. Father, tonight I just ask you to bless your people as they give. Father, move upon every heart. Father, let them know that they're sowing into good ground, Lord. Wherever the feet of these evangelists go, the territory belongs to us as well. And it's for the kingdom, Lord. Father, we thank you for souls that's going to be saved. Lives that's going to be transformed. Prodigals that's going to come home. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, bless your people tonight as they give. You may give in the mighty name of Jesus. Supply the need, satisfy the thirst, supply the need, for in our life's your first, your abundance far exceeds all the depth of the seas, so won't be 
bended knees I'm asking you supply the need Can we give Chris and this band a mighty round of applause? Wow. Wow, they rock the house tonight. Honor these guys. Listen, you're in for a treat tonight. I'm telling you, you're truly in for a treat. I have one of my, one of my dear friends that's about to come and bring you a, a mighty powerful word. I've, I've met him about, it's been about 15 years ago. Had the honor of meeting him. This dude drove... 13 hours, drove to be at mine and my wife's wedding, and then get up and preach the next morning. <laughs> so, man, I'm telling you, he's a dear friend, powerful, power evangelist. And listen, I'm telling you, you're not going to be the same. Would you stand up on your feet one more time? You get your exercise when you're here at the basement, okay? And let's give my, my dear friend, no, 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 Frank no, no, no. Shelton, a round of applause. I love you. Amen. Wow. Well, while you're standing, while you're standing... While you're standing, one, of, it's an honor to be back in Georgia. Number two, in case you've missed the memo, there's been a lot of things falling lately. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And if I can quote what one Motown singer, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. Yeah. California Highway Pacific 1, been on it many times, just crashed into the Pacific Ocean. 9-11, my office was evacuated. When you've actually lived through a little bit of war, you're not weak in these last days. Yes. Capitol Police officer came in and screamed, run for your life on 9-11. My office was one block from the U.S. Capitol. I had friends in both twin towers of 9-11. The Pentagon is now on fire, but 9-11 fell. Just 10 days ago, Francis Scott Key Bridge collapsed into the ocean. When 9-11 fell, the Holy Spirit said, what you can see is temporal, but what you cannot see is eternal. When the COVID hit and threw a curve, the NFL fell, the NBA fell, Major League Baseball fell, NASCAR fell, and I'm telling you, a lot of our systems that we thought would last forever failed and fell before our very eyes. But Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me, and I'm telling you, the world will fall. I'm telling you, life is not going to be easy, but Jesus is not a good way to heaven. He's not your best way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. He's here tonight, and can we give Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, a loud peach shade round of applause. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Chris McDaniel, brother, that was amazing. It's been an honor to tag team with him and Felicia and the band. Andy, can you give them one loud round of applause? They are amazing. I uh, just want to say, Dakota, I love you with all my heart. What an honor it was to catch up with you and Pastor Ron. These guys are true leaders. And, uh, you know, there's a scene. I was an extra in Rocky Balboa, and Paulie, who was Adrian's brother, said, like, have you haven't peaked? Is there something still left in the basement? And I'm telling you, there's a lot still left here in the basement. Aren't you thankful that on a Friday night, the bars are looking for what you guys already found here? The happy hour is not at the bar. I'm telling you, it's in the house of God. And will the redeemed of the Lord say so? Say amen. amen. Heard a joke not long ago. There was a John Hagee, matter of fact, his son wrote the forward to my second book, The Blessedness of Brokenness. I laughed when I heard Pastor Hagee said this. He said, quote, this preacher was concerned about his 13-year-old son. If you're concerned with the direction, the way your kids are going, raise your hand. We need to pray for them, amen? It's probably harder than ever to be a teenager these days. John Hagee said this pastor was concerned about the way his son was going, and he prayed and fasted, but instead of giving it to God, 
He took matters into his own hands. And he snuck into his boy's bedroom while he was at school, and he put a Bible on the boy's dresser. He said, well, if he grabs that, praise God, I guess he's going to be a preacher. He put a silver dollar next to that and says, well, if he grabs that, not so bad. Maybe he'll be the local banker in my hometown. Then he put a bottle of whiskey next to that, and he said, well, if he grabs that, he's going to be the town drunk. And then he put an inappropriate magazine next to it, and he said, if he grabs that, well, I guess he's going to be a womanizer. Well, the pastor hid in the closet of the boy, and when the school bus came back dropping him off from middle school, the moment of truth, the pastor, the parent, is hiding in the closet. The boy comes in his own bedroom, and he sees the Bible, he sees the dollar, he sees the whiskey, and he sees the magazine, and which one does he grab? He grabs all four of them. And he said, dear God, he's going to run for Congress. Can I get an amen? <laughs> for four years, I had the honor to lead a Bible study to our lawmakers. And you know, the church was great going after the poor, but we failed to go after the powerful and the popular. And you know what? Even senators need the Savior. Representatives need the Redeemer. Delegates need the divine. County commissioners need Christ. And guys, the answer is not in the government. The answer is not in the globalists. The answers are not in gates. It's in God Almighty. Give him one more round of applause. Amen. I have some dear friends. Brian and Jamie Johnson drove four and a half hours from South Carolina, drove nine hours round trip to be here tonight. I'm telling you, I love you. Brian and his wife have one of the greatest ministries that I know. They have an amazing, anointed marketplace ministry. If you promote God, God will promote you. They are selling cars. They just sold one to my dear friend Nikita Koloff, the world wrestling champ. Just sold one to his daughter. I'm telling you, every time someone buys a car, they put a Bible in the glove box. They have sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cars. And I'm telling you, Promote God, God will promote you. I read in the New Testament one time, Jesus' name is mentioned 115 times in the New Testament, but to my knowledge, he's only mentioned 12 times in the synagogue. The one who was perfect, who had perfect attendance, spent more time out of church than in it. Hear my heart. I'm not saying it's a free pass not to come to church because in these last days, we need to be in more church than out of it. Jesus said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth? He said, occupy till I come. But I will tell you this. Jesus was the first to have a marketplace ministry. And Brian and Jamie are killing it for the king of all kings. Will you give them a round of applause for driving out of state? I love you guys. They have the most cutest daughter. She's in the, their nursery. Her name is Presley. But man, she can sing the stars down. But I love her with all my heart. And uh, I just want to share a message. Felicia, that was, you're amazing. I love to hear all of you do your thing. She's so gifted. I've booked the whole band in advance to sing at my funeral. <laughs> do you know why? I'm dying to hear them one more time. Praise the Lord. She said something. Well, first of all, Chris said something about the lepers. The lepers. When I was a kid, my hero was the Lone Ranger. But as an adult, my hero is the lone leper. All of them were touched by the triune God. All of them were hugged by heaven. And all of them were healed by him. But only one of them came back to say thanks. I often remember if we only are guaranteed to tithe at least 10, that's where it starts. If only one out of 10 come back, I've never heard anyone else say this. I know there's nothing new under the sun, but those are the same odds that only 10% actually came back to God to say thanks. Guys, I'm telling you in these last days, Thanksgiving is not a Thursday in November. It needs to be every single day. Felicia said we need to make room. I worked in four White Houses. Uh, the guy saw Air Force One, the 747, was parked at Atlanta's airport next to Delta when I arrived today. I'm from Washington. I can't get away from this stuff. They follow me. Are you with me? 
I came in on Southwest. Do you know what Delta means? Don't expect to leave the airport. Are you with me? <laughs> My favorite is don't expect the luggage to arrive. But when I worked on Capitol Hill, I did 20 years. I worked for the House, the Senate, the governor, worked at four White Houses. The wild thing, I heard a story that broke my heart. They heard of a president that was overseas on a goodwill trip. The country wasn't expecting them. It was a last second of revival. And true story, they extracted four floors of paying customers who had already checked in, who already paid, and they threw them out of a four-star hotel to make room for a head of state. But 2,000 years ago, when Mary and Joseph was with child, we had rooms for royalty, but we shut the door on the Redeemer. We made room for presidents, but slammed the door on the Prince of Peace. We throw out the red carpet for Hollywood stars, but we stiff-armed heaven's son. Why? Because we didn't make room for him. You know, I think of Mary. Mary delivered Jesus in birth, but it was Jesus who delivered Mary and death. Mary, did you know that this child that you delivered would soon deliver you? See, God used a virgin womb and a virgin tomb to make room for you. And see, when you borrow something, you only need it for a little while. And guys, I'm telling you, God's not only wanting to borrow you, he wants to indwell in you. The greatest high is not heroin, it's heaven. It's not crack, it's Christ. It's not marijuana, it's being tapped into the master. And there's no high like the most high. Crack and cocaine has nothing on Christ. And I just want to encourage you, be a billboard in these last days for Jesus. Some preach, some teach, but we each can reach. You're a billboard. You don't represent Calvin Klein. You represent Christ the King. You don't represent Adidas. You represent the Almighty. You don't represent Jordan. You represent Jesus. And people, when they see you, hopefully they'll see him. I believe there's five gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and what's the gospel according to you? Because the greatest sermon is in what's said Sunday. It's how you live Monday when the whole world's watching. Guys, I'm telling you, we need authenticity like never before. President Carter is in hospice. I had the honor to meet him three times. I'd never heard of a man that's lived almost a year in hospice. The interesting thing is it was in his administration, 1978, they had made the Susan B. Anthony, it was a silver dollar. The irony is it was worth a dollar, but they temporarily pulled it. And in case you forgot why, the problem is it was worth a dollar. But from about five feet, it resembled the quarter. You say, what does that mean in Georgia in 2024? As Christians, we're worth the Lord. But when you get under the hood... Too many of us act just like the world. And the Bible says we've been bought with a price and we need to glorify God. I'm telling you, Jesus stuck on the cross for me and I'm going to stick with the one who stuck on the cross for me. I'm not going to get political, but it was Lincoln who died to free the slaves. If I was going to align with one group, that'd be a good start. And then Jesus the Christ died on the cross to forgive us, and we got more than half the world bound down to Buddha, Confucius, Muhammad, secret societies, Wiccas, cults. We are chasing a bunch of frauds, and we turned our back on the one who forgave. Amen. See, in the last days, the obvious isn't always obvious. My dad's friend for seven years was a bodyguard to Elvis Presley. Elvis gave away a Cadillac to him. I am holding a 357 Magnum, that Elvis Presley gave him in the bedroom of Graceland. He flew on the Lisa Marie jet on a regular basis. He was a pallbearer at Elvis Presley. But in 1975, Elvis was off tour. He had gained a little bit of weight. In 1973, the Aloha concert and the White Eagle jumpsuit. In 73, the jumpsuit was $68,000. The belt was 12,500. The cape was $23,000, not last week in 73. True story, more people watched Elvis 
in Hawaii on that concert than the landing of the first American on the moon. Over a billion with the B watched Elvis. He not only took off the belt and threw it in the crowd, he took off the cape and threw it in the crowd. He was wearing a ring, it was 42.5, $42,000, and he gave it to one person. And see, the rock that he just gave was precious. The rock that you and I carry in our heart is priceless. And Elvis didn't hesitate to loan it. What's your excuse tonight in Georgia? Dwayne Johnson is not the rock. Your wife's ring is not the rock. Jesus is the rock of all ages. You're never more like God when you're giving and forgiving. Tonight, who do you need to forgive? And isn't it interesting that the word giving is in both words? But in 1975, Elvis is reading in a magazine. I believe it was the Memphis Tribune and Elvis had gained a little bit of weight. From 73 to 75, he put on about 50 pounds. But there was nobody in recent time that had his charisma. I saw him twice at age five in concert. I saw him concert 10 and 12 before he died. I had never seen that many light bulbs go off in my life. The irony is the bodyguards were like, Elvis, why are you laughing? He said, I hear there's an Elvis Presley impersonator contest tonight a hundred miles from here. And the guy said, well, what are you going to do? He, he said, I'm going to enter myself in the Elvis Presley impersonator <laughs> contest. He said, on one condition, you boys, the bodyguards are staying home tonight. Elvis got in his own Cadillac. I used to drive our congressman, the Elvis is driving himself, shows up unannounced, didn't register, and true story, Elvis Presley came in second place. <laughs> we didn't have the Inquirer like we do now. We don't have 24-7 CNN, Fox around. They didn't realize he had put on that much weight. But even deeper than that, you can, one, take greatness for granted Number two, the obvious is an obvious. And number three, we have been bowing too long to counterfeits and miss the crucified and coming Christ. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full at his wonderful face and the things of the world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. What's grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. So now that we're making room... And we need to go back to basics. I really believe that's where God's having us tonight, back to basics. You know, as a former basketball coach, I, I coached some of the little kids after graduating high school. Everybody wanted to hit the three-pointer. Everybody's trying to do the razzle-dazzle. Most games are lost on missed free throws and missed layups. If you only lose by four, and your team missed 12 free shots from the line. You failed. And see, basics seem elementary, and they are. But Larry Bird used to shoot 500 free throws every day, 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade. And there's a reason he's in the Hall of Fame today. We got to go back to the basics. You know why some of these churches are failing? They're preaching the newspaper. They're financial gurus. They're life coaches. And they forgot the main thing, the main thing. Jesus is the son of God. He's the only way. And time is almost out. And some of us are so busy playing religion, we've turned our back on the Redeemer. You know, some of these folks parade themselves like a Ferrari. But when you get under the hood, it's just a Fiero. See, they're kit cars. They're all showing they're no go. And they ain't going to be going anywhere when the Lord comes. There's Pharisees and Sadducees. What sad you see, they had Jesus on their lips, but they didn't have him in their life. They had him in their head, but they didn't have him in their heart. And they had a rhetoric, a routine, and a religion, but they didn't have a real relationship with the Redeemer. We serve a good, good God. Amen. If you know God has been good to you, say amen. I want to, Amen. The, let the little children say amen. I want to give a shout out to Coda's parents. I love you with all my heart. I don't know who this is for. It may be someone here. It may be someone online. 
But I want to encourage you, you may be down, discouraged, defeated, depressed, have a disease, be in debt, be divorced. But if you're not dead, the divine is not done with you. The Lord resurrects dead things. He delights in dead beats. You can't keep a good man down and you can't keep the God man down. You can't keep him in the corner. You can't keep him in the grave. You can't keep him dead. And guys, if God before you, who can be against you? And I have a word for you tonight. The king has the last word. He has the last say. He has the last laugh. And he always has the last move. You may feel like it's all over. You're cornered. People are already talking behind your back. This is where we got them. But I'm telling you. If you're not dead, he's not done. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Acts, Acts chapter 16. And I'm convinced we're living in the book of Acts all over again. You know, when I think of the word revival, the word remnant is there before revival, even in the dictionary. And you guys are the remnant. You know, when you first buy a rug, they'll give you this extra piece Some have actually called it the remnant. And the irony is, I heard of a story one time, the guy couldn't afford carpet all the way in his house, but he had a remnant by his bed, and that brother would be praying night after night on his knees. Did it for days, did it for months, did it for years. And when he died, it was almost a holy hush because when the grandkids, after coming from the wake, they hadn't been in that room in years. When they finally came in, they saw something they had never seen before. There was something peculiar. It stopped them in their tracks. Where that remnant was, there were two perfectly oval holes in the carpet. And what happened, that senior saint, that man who chased God and lived faithfully all his years, the oval holes were from his knees. And I'm telling you, we find more power than the Pentagon is when we pray. God answers knee mail. And I was told when you kneel before God, you can stand before any man. Heaven is still just a prayer away. And you know what? These iPhones are pretty neat. You can spend twelve, thirteen hundred dollars $1,300 for an iPhone. But if you don't plug it in once in a while, it's not worth a dime. Number two, I'm going to take some of you to school. Prince, the recording artist, said it best. It's okay to use technology, but don't let technology use you. Some of us got our face more in Facebook than our face in the book of life, the Bible. And I'm just going to throw this out there. This is a fact. I wrote a book. It was the number one new release on all of Amazon when it came out. It's called Urgency. It's an hourglass, and the sand of time has almost slipped through. Did you know on the back of the iPhone, there's an apple? It has a chunk in it. The irony is... Some tried to say it was Isaac Newton. Some would try to say knowledge. Some would say education. But I was proven true. It goes back to the fall of Adam and Eve. See, it wasn't the apple or the fruit in the tree. It was the pear on the ground that wrecked it for humanity. He said, you can have all of this. Number two, wasn't only an apple with a chunk in it. I felt like I said, Lord, so you mean to tell me these clowns have made a trillion dollars with a T over the fall of man? And do you know, this is a fact, the first Apple computer that was sold, it sold for $666. And number three, the person that designed the ad campaign was a 33-degree Freemason, and that's the gospel truth. It's okay to use computers, but don't let computers and technology use you. We're going to beat the devil at his own game. But guys, I'm telling you, if the king is coming, Schwarzenegger wasn't the first to say, I'll be back. It was Jesus, and he's coming really, really soon. But since we're in the book of Acts, I got 21 minutes. So if I can quote what Elizabeth Taylor told her seventh husband, I love you, but I won't keep you long. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Amen. Acts 16, verse 16. I'm going to ask that you stand one last time because if I was reading the newspaper, I would let you sit it out. If I was quoting from the Quran and I never would, it's not worth standing. But because we're talking the Bible, we're going to stand in honor of Christ. Amen? Amen. 
Acts 16, and it came to pass as we went to prayer, say prayer, prayer. there was a certain damsel who was demonically possessed and brought her master's much gain by her soothsaying or fortune telling. These were pimps 2,000 years ago. 17, the same followed Paul and cried saying, these men are servants of the most high God, which show us the way of salvation. And they did this many days, but Paul being grieved, turned to the demonic spirit and said, I command thee in the name of the Pope, come out. That wasn't what he said. He said in the name of Muhammad, it was too weak. He said in the name of Jesus, come out. And immediately the demon came out. Why? Because there's power in the name. Did you know atheists even scream the name Jesus and they don't think he's real? Why don't you save millions of dollars with lawsuits? If you swear he doesn't real, one, why do you lose sleep at night? Because your conscience is pricked. You know he's real. And number two, if you ever wake up and stub your toe at 3, 8 in the morning, the first words out of your mouth is not Buddha. Sadly, the only time we say the Lord's name is in vain. But there's power in the name. And the moment they said, Jesus, come out, the demon came out. And when her master saw that their hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them to the marketplace and said, these men exceedingly trouble our city. You saw a preview of it during the lockdown. I have a pastor friend who was the first preacher in America in Tampa who was arrested for having church during COVID. Will the real men of God stand up? Because many stepped out. And teach us customs which aren't lawful to receive being Romans. And the crowd rose up against him and commanded that they be beat. I'm telling you, God is a prosperous God, but persecution will come our way. They hated him. They're going to hate us. But I'd rather be persecuted for Christ than be promoted by the devil. 23, when they laid many stripes on him, they threw them in prison And they didn't only put them in prison, they put them in the innermost prison and put their feet in handcuffs. And 25, and at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, saying, praises to God, and the prisoners heard them. There was a great earthquake, the foundation shook, and immediately all the doors opened wide, and everyone's handcuffs were dropped. And the keeper of the prison came out of his sleep, and the prison doors, he flew out the sword, he was getting ready to commit suicide. And then he cried with a loud voice, do yourself no harm, we're still here. And then he came in with a light. And they fell down before Paul and Silas, and he said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? And he said, Believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou be saved. And then he cleansed him, fed him, and took him home and washed their stripes, and his entire family got saved. And then he said, You can go in peace. Why? Because he was already connected to the Prince of Peace. You have no power if your phone's not plugged in. And you don't have power if you're not plugged in and prayed up with Christ in these last days. You can be seated. Has anybody ever been late to church? Say amen. Amen. Have you ever been heading to church and you're promoting heaven and then you got the kids in the back and they're putting gum in each other's hair? They're actually making fun of each other. The other one's in tears and you're going to heaven and you got hell in the back seat. Are you with me? (laughs) Then all of a sudden you're walking in and you're a couple minutes late. And you look like you got this innermost turmoil and all of a sudden everybody's like, good to see you, old man, doing great. God bless you. Good to see you. Are you with me? (laughs) Guys, I'm telling you, you don't have to fake it coming to church. Just be real. But the key is keep coming to church. Keep coming to Christ. Paul and Silas were God's men going to God's house. It was a Wednesday night prayer meeting. And Chris and the team is amazing. They've been with the best in the world. They were considered the best in a lot of those groups. Phenomenal. And isn't it neat when some of your heroes fall in love with him? And guys, I'm telling you, they're anointed. And I rack up some miles, but Chris and his team goes crazy. And they're having more fun serving the Lord now. I wouldn't take nothing for my journey now. Paul and Silas, one was going to do the preach and one was the praise and one was the sing and one was the speak and one was the music, one was the message. Just like tonight, we all have a gift to play. The difference is I preach heaven and I sing like hell. Are you with me? I got cut from the fourth grade choir. I thought everybody made the choir. They don't at Malcolm Elementary. 
I thought they were looking for anybody. Well, it was anybody but me. Are you with me? Well, what do you sing, Frank? Well, I'm a tenor. Well, do it 10 or 12 feet away from me. Are you with me? Try it out again. Well, maybe solo. Thank God I'm on the team. No, sing so low, they don't even hear you. Are you with me? True story, I got cut. But God will use goofball, broken, imperfect people to promote a perfect, holy God. See, religion says you got to do that, you got to do that, you got to do that. Time out. That's a bunch of doo-doo. Can I get an amen? amen? Religion says do it. No, God said it's done. Amen. So there was George Beverly Shea and there was Billy Graham. Darling Check and some preacher in Houston. And the wild thing is that the music, the message, the singing and the speaking, and they're on the way to church, but they see from their peripheral vention a damsel in distress. And one of the reasons we're failing today in Christianity, we are so busy playing church that we fail to continue to be the church. Number two, God ain't coming back for beautiful brick buildings. He's coming back for blood-bought believers. And some of us got so professional, we lost the personal touch. And number three, some of us are so busy preaching to the choir, we've turned our back on a lost sinful society. Do you know Satan would rather have these two, the Grammy winner and the God-appointed man? They would rather you go to church and just play church than sometimes pause and pivot and actually be the church. Now, they weren't going to church, and then they see this damsel in distress, and she wasn't going to church, and they thought, well, what would Jesus do? You remember the bracelet, WWJD? I told Dakota today at lunch, when you're single, it meant who would Jesus date? Praise the Lord. Some of you will get it tomorrow, but that was good preaching. Are you with me? But Jesus fed 5,000 one night. He fed 4,000 another, but he's with the woman wounded at the well the next. See, success, we learned a long time ago, is not in the crowds. It's still in Christ. And success isn't in the size of the sanctuary. It's in the size of our obedience. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you go in Jesus' name. And this woman wasn't going to church. She was actually making a living with astrology. She would actually read people's palms. It's demonic. You know, the biggest house in my hometown, I think it's about 9,000 square feet. They recently, in front of a 9,000 square foot colonial, everyone was excited. Well, what are they going to put there? What are they going to put there? You know what the crazy thing is? The entire thing is a palm reading place where people pay to go into a house that looks like Graceland to get their future. The biggest house in town needs Jesus. And here's the thing. The answer is not in astrology. It's in the Almighty. And if you're going to read anyone's palms, it better be the nail-scarred palms of Jesus. And some of us are looking to stars. Well, we should look to the scars of the one who was slain for us. Now, she wasn't going to church, so they paused and they pivot. And she wasn't going to church, but praise God, they brought church to her. And they told her how they could be free. The guilt was replaced by grace. She was going to hell and now going to heaven, and she was demonically possessed, and now she's a child of the king. The good news is she got free. Say free. Free. Now, she went free, but they got incarcerated. They got arrested. They probably thought, God, I thought if we serve God, ain't nothing going bad. That ain't true. The irony is she got delivered, and they get in prison. And sometimes in the natural, it looks like God failed me. Where's the Lord in all this? I didn't sign up for this. And a lot of people will quit when it doesn't get easy. Man, when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. He could have snapped his fingers and 10,000 angels could have scooped him off. But if he saved himself, we'd be damned tonight in Georgia. The irony is they got in prison and their back is against the wall. I want to show you number one. Have you ever promoted heaven and went through hell? Have you ever did the right thing and then got left out? I preached at my home church about 10 years ago, and I was just saying there's freedom in God, but we need to let the past be the past. And I said, maybe you're here tonight, and maybe you're living together, not trying to be 
disrespectful, but the Bible says we need to let that go. It's better to get right with God and lose a relationship than two people slide into a devil's hell. And I said, why don't you come forward if you like to get right with God? He'll forgive you. And true story, one lady came up weeping like Niagara Falls. She got free. Say free. free. The good news is she got free. And then her living boyfriend's right behind her. But he looks upset. He said, man, you're Frank Shelton. I said, no, Dakota Culberson. Good to see you. Are you with me? <laughs> she got free. He got upset. But I'm telling you. Sometimes you got to tell them exactly what it is. And you know what? I end up seeing both of them get saved before it was all over. Some people will get it immediately. Some people will hate you. But just keep living them and loving them like Jesus. My boss was Billy Graham. They said, how did Billy Graham handle his critics? He said, number one, I made a point. I was going to outlive them or outlove them. But either way, I was going to do my best with both. He lived almost to be 100. He ended up doing both. If you don't have any critics on earth, you're not a helper for Christ. So there they are in prison. How you act at your lowest point shows who you really are. You know, Pastor Ron and Chris, we can all sing his praises. But the mark of maturity is can you sing his praises? Can you stick with the stuff in the storm? All of us can give him glory when the promotion comes. But when you get the eviction notice, it's a whole nother level. When the guy was best man in your wedding runs off with maybe the one you had, it's a lot harder to sing his praises. But Jesus, I used to give him a free pass. If he would have slipped up and said one curse word on the cross, who could blame him? If he slipped up with one curse word, he wouldn't be the sinless savior to save our soul. At the lowest point, he showed us who he really was. We had a rare weekend night one time, and um, my family asked the wife and kids, where do you want to go? And they all screamed, the Bonefish Grill. It's a seafood place. And we walked in there, and Dakota, it was a two-hour wait to get in the door. Another 25 minutes before the waitress even came up to say hi. My wife is rolling her eyes. My daughter's like this. And I said, yeah, baby girl. And she goes, this place stinks. They owe us like free appetizers. It's ruined my night. I deserve much better than this. I'm like, good God, who teaches you all this stuff? Are you with me? <laughs> she goes, Daddy, the service stinks. Let's just get up and leave. Well, you probably would have left. I'm a guy. I'm a little bit different. I'm like, no, I got a tent in the back. We're going to camp out tonight. Are you with me? <laughs> Three hours and 10-minute mark. We finally place our order. And when it came out, it was extremely cold. You can usually tell a good restaurant at the parking lot is packed. It was packed. And when I walked in, I saw a few people, and I'm always trying to be respectful. Good to see you. God bless you. But when I sat down, when the waitress came up, I didn't recognize her. But here's the thing. We got to be a billboard for Jesus whether they recognize you or not. And my wife took one bite, and she's a sweet, humble lady. She said, this is frustrating. And she got up and took the little one out. And it's just me and Hannah. And she does this again. And I said, yeah, baby girl. She said, dad, this is ridiculous. They owe us two appetizers. And when that lady comes over, you need to give her a piece of your mind. She needs to write the whole check back. And she said, you need to give it to her. And I got a nanosecond. And I'm thinking, what would Jesus do? And the flesh is telling me throw lightning. But the Lord's saying, give love. And she's coming over my way, and she's like, give it to her, give it to her, give it to her. <laughs> and I handed her my debit card, and I said, sweetheart, I said, it's really good to see you. And I heard her say, give it to her. <laughs> it was like Darth Vader. <laughs> Nine out of ten years. <laughs> I said, sweetheart, mama said there will be days like this. This is one of our favorite restaurants. The place is packed. I know they're working extra hard. It's not your fault. It's not the Kirk's fault. I want to apologize for a lot of Christians. We're not all rich, but I want to apologize for everyone that's burned you in a tip. You know, they think it's cute to come in Sunday and act like they're too good to leave a tip. Yeah. So even though it wasn't what we thought, I don't blame you. Even the best have an off night, and I'm going to tip you, and I hope your night gets easier when I leave. 
she smiled and left. And my daughter goes like this. She goes, you're a wimp. <laughs> you should have gave it to her, dad. And I'm sliding in my seat, feeling like the world's biggest loser. I'm six one, but I felt about three foot two. And as God is my witness, my mom and I talked about the other day, the woman, the waitress I'd never seen before, and I actually have a pretty good memory. She's coming towards me in front of half that crowd. She screamed, I thought that was you. You're Frank Shelton. She's looking at my debit card, Franklin C. Shelton Jr. She said, you preached eight years ago at Hughesville Baptist Church. I got saved the night you preached. <laughs> She says, I want to tell you, my life's never been the same. And I gave her the card, and I said, God bless you. My daughter goes like this. She goes, whoa, you just dodged a bullet, Dad. <laughs> the same girl that's fighting over appetizers when the Almighty was hanging in the balance, literally between heaven and earth, suspended between two thugs, two thieves, two terrorists. And what did he do in his dying act? He was still going after and saving one more. And friends, if that was his dying act, that should be our living act. I'm going to say this in love. 9,000 Baptist churches the year before COVID didn't baptize one person in one calendar year. 9,000 churches in America. We don't even live up to John the Baptist's name, much less Jesus the Christ's name. And I'm not going to hesitate, but my friends, we are failing. Do you know years ago, there was a beautiful lighthouse on top of the rocks. And the lighthouse would do a light in the dark to get the ships from crashing at sea. But something happened. I believe it was up in the northeast. It was a billion-dollar view. But some of the elders and business thought it would be better to turn in to a country club, a BR bed and breakfast. It won by an extra vote, and you know the irony of irony is it basically went from a saving station to a sleeping station. And the irony is the lighthouse was to shine and save, and it went from a lighthouse to an odd house. The lighthouse saves, the odd house stinks. 9,000 churches in America, and half of them are the same crowd. Oh, well, well, you don't believe revivals work anymore. Three weeks ago, I preached in Tennessee and Bristol. And in four nights, we saw 205 people give their life to Christ yeah. in Tennessee. Yeah. One night, we rented a, We had the 2,000-seat tent. We were in Monroeville, Alabama, in a town of 6,000. And we put up a 2,000-seat tent. And about 25 deacons or pastors said, we take out 300 or 400 chairs. And I said, in a 2,000-seat tent? I said, man, we got to throw it out there by faith. They said, well, we've never done this before. I said, well, I appreciate your honesty, but we're going to swing for the fence. And you know what? We ran 1,800 for seven nights in a row in a town of 6,000, and 405 gave their life to Christ, and one entire family got saved, and one guy had just gotten out of jail, and 24 hours later, he got Jesus. But I'm going to just say this in love. Everybody went nuts in a good way, but we had nine pastors who boycotted the altar call. And when everyone else was come forward, they linked hands and walked out. Yeah. I'm telling you, God called me to do the work of an evangelist, not the work of a Calvinist. Amen. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. Number two, if you truly believe it was a select few and you happen to be one of them, shame on you for strutting like a peacock thinking you somehow got picked and your next door neighbor didn't have a chance. People ask me today, so your boss was Billy Graham and people like you and Chris, you spend a third of the month living in hotels. Do you really think you make a difference? Jesus makes the difference, but I believe we're part of the process. You know, the greatest party of all time is not going to be hell. I was recently on an interview recently with a guy who's worth a billion with a B. You don't need the king of beers once you know the king of kings. And, you know, you look on television, you see beaches, babes, bikinis, bikers, and beer, and you're going to think the biggest hell party is either on earth or hell. It's not. The biggest party of all time is heaven. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just trying to take everyone to heaven. Amen. You know, if you win the lottery and it's $300 million, the IRS gets half. So say it's down to 150 but three other people won. You each get maybe $50 million. 
But you know what? When you get the Lord, it's greater than the lottery. Jesus is the jackpot. And you don't have to gamble when you already got God. But here's the thing. The IRS don't get a part and no one else loses. Everyone gets the full amount. So if Elvis is giving away bling, don't you withhold the king and that's good preaching. So she wasn't going to church and they brought church to her and they are now in prison. I visited a few people in prison. I had one guy tell me, Frank, when the music was gone and the lights faded and the girls left and the party was over, you learn who your real friends are when you're in prison. One said, you're the only one to come see me when I was buying bars. Back to the iPhone, not trying to be cute or a joke. But we need homework, friends. It's not an accident. They call it a cell phone. Some people get an update. Good God, 10 hours of screen time. Some of you have been put in prison because you put yourself in prison. And there is a thing coming to America. You say, I don't believe it. It's coming. So is the king. But they want to bring 15-minute smart cities. If the globalists have their way, you'll never be able to travel further than 15 minutes. How do you know? I got an award at the United Nations. You think Congress is dark. I was basically born in the halls of Congress. My mom and dad both worked there. Spent 20 years of my life, and I loved every minute of it. Congress is one thing. It's the belly of the beast in the United Nations. That building isn't even on U.S. soil. And guys, I'm telling you, the United Nations doesn't have our best interests in mind. I was having lunches with ambassadors. They were telling me in 2016 about a 2030 plan. They don't want you to be able to grow your own crops. They don't want you, they want to push a world, one world government, one world currency, one world religion. You watch the six o'clock news. Some people are already testing with this things that you can go to a whole food store and not only pay for it, you need it to enter. And they think it's cool. If you're lost, it's cool. If you know Christ, it's the beast system coming down the pike. Guys, I'm telling you, we have lost our minds and there's a falling away of the faith. And, and I don't want to beat anyone up, but man, we bowed to Fauci when we should have been bowing to the Father's Son. Yeah. Soon as I heard the slogan, trust the science, I was the first in America to say, trust the Savior. It went viral. Yeah. Trust the Savior. And guys, I'm telling you, that's the past. We can learn from it, but don't make the same mistake twice. Yeah. So you'll learn who you are in prison. You'll learn who your real friends are in prison, and you'll learn who God is. Self-help is one thing, but God help is everything. In the luge, I was in Paris recently, and Lord willing, I'm going to go back. I have the honor to be a chaplain for my fourth Olympics. If the Lord tarries, I'll be at the 24 Olympics in Paris for my fourth Olympics. 2012 was London, 16 Rio, 2020, COVID threw a curve on the way to Tokyo. But we're going after souls. At one Olympics, we led 1,054 people to Jesus during the Olympics. From three Uber drivers to gold medalists. My roommate was a gold medalist. Man, I told Carl Lewis one time, I said, Carl, the only thing I could beat you is to the buffet line at Golden Corral. He laughed. Are you with me? <laughs> but just like I got cut from the fourth grade choir, I'm now preaching with the Dove Award winners. Are you with me? <laughs> and now I'm ministering to these guys faster than a Ferrari. But you don't have to be the best when you've been blessed by the best. Because the test is letting him do the rest. There was a story of a woman who was so pretty, Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder and Ronnie Millsap could see how good she looked. <laughs> My one buddy was atheist, and when she walked in the room, he said, there is a God. <laughs> Two atoms in the sky didn't make this one. Are you with me? <laughs> she actually knew his name. And she said, do you want to go with me to the art museum? And he said, that's not his favorite place, but because Miss Universe said you want to go, They'll go grocery shopping. Are you with me? And he's thinking it may be a semi-boring for the first two minutes, and you're supposed to look at this art and politely go on to the next one. And he comes up against this controversial painting. It's known around the world. It's Satan playing a senior citizen. And the name of the painting is called Checkmate. And the painting was an atheist artist who had the audacity to insinuate that in the game of life, Satan not only runs the board, he wins the game. And you know what's sad? A lot of people believe that. And you're supposed to politely hem and on and go to the next picture. And as the group went on, 
he's standing there, and I've been told chess people are so smooth they can do two and three moves in advance. Pastor Ron, I'm so slow it takes two hours to watch 60 minutes. Can I get an amen? <laughs> I talked to my wife, Ruth, and she said to remind you it took me an hour to cook minute rice. <laughs> That's why I'm still playing checkers. But he's looking at that, and this holy anger came off, and the light bulb went off, and he asked the historian of the art museum, can you come over here? And there was a little bit of ruckus, and his own group was like, hey, man, come on. You're holding us up. He said, sir, is there something wrong? He goes, indeed, there is. He said, do you know who painted the painting? And he said, yes, I do. He said, well, it's dead wrong. He said, what do you mean? He goes, sir, I'm not trying to brag. I've been staying at that, and you need to either rename the painting or you have to put a black felt over it and cover it on top of it. He said, son, why would I do that? And he said, I'm not trying to drop names. I'm not trying to be rude. And I'm certainly not trying to be arrogant. He said, here in my heart. But I'm on this date with this girl today, and she doesn't even know this. I'm an international chess champion. And I've been staring at that painting, and it's wrong because the king actually has one more move. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who was in a fiery furnace. And they threw him. And remember this. The Bible says they turned it up seven times hotter. Why seven? Well, first of all, that showed the hatred. But it was actually perfection. And they had such hatred towards them, just like the Jews were thrown in these fiery furnace. Guys, I'm telling you, it may not get easy serving the Lord. But it wasn't easy for him when he was at Calvary. And you know what? I'm tired of easy and mediocrity and smooth sailing. I'd rather be in Pakistan with bombs going off and the will of God than be at the beach drunk as a skunk and getting ready to, to slip hell wide open if you don't know the Lord. And guys, I'm telling you, we don't need the fake. It has gotten us nowhere. We need the authentic. We don't need the Fiero. We want the Ferrari. But this late in the game, we don't need a Ferrari. We just need the Father, Son, because that's where freedom and forgiveness gives us a future. Yeah. And the irony is, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they turned the flames hotter. And the irony is they looked in the flame. They said, well, we threw three in there, but there seems to be a fourth. And darn if it's not the Son of God. Yeah. Now, the irony is when I get ready to see the three Hebrew boys, the brothers from another mother, I can't wait to ask them. I said, man, I got to know. Did you know that God had your back? Did you know that Jesus was in the flames with you? Because the Bible doesn't say that the three of them knew they did, but their enemies and the guards who tried to kill them could see them in the fire. Sometimes when you go through a storm, it's not because you're so bad. It's that the enemies can see how good and faithful he is. Are you with me? And then here's the wild thing. Some people give people enough rope to hang themselves. The Bible says, don't touch thine anointed. And the interesting thing is they're in the fire and not one of them burned. And then all of a sudden, boom, the flame blew up and it actually says it killed the guards. And the three boys got out and the smell of smoke wasn't even on their clothes. How did they get out? The king had one more move. And then there's Moses and he's going to the Red Sea in front of him. He got the enemy boom, coming up behind him and there's mountains on both sides of him. And the enemies are like, that's where we got them now. These suckers are going down. Game over. The end. Ain't no hope. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says, sometimes we want God to part the sea 20 years in advance. Some of us 20 steps in advance. 20 seconds in advance. The Bible says it wasn't until the sandal slapped the sea that it split. You got to do your part before he does his part. It wouldn't take faith if it was called Easy Street. See, I believe God ain't dying to save us. He's dying to use us in the bottom of the night. And the irony is they stepped in. It split. The good guys go through. The bad guys drown in a crash. How did they get through? The king had one more move. So then you got Daniel in the lion's den. And the guards are mocking, thinking, well, we got him now. And they saw a lad. They saw a lion. And they thought, there's lunch. And the natural... But God didn't see a lad, a lion at lunch. God said, I see the lad, a lion, and I'm going to give him lockjaw. And the irony is the lad was eye to eye with the lion. Stallone owes royalties to this guy because he had the first eye of the tiger. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Rocky three. And nothing happened. Why? Because when God before you can be against you. Now, 
the guards who were arrogant, demonically possessed, out to kill him, who's laughing, thinking this is where it's over. Go back and read it tonight. The Bible says the lion didn't even kill when he was right in proximity. When he was hanging over, something happened where the guard fell out of the balcony. Go back and read it. The bad guy falls out, and what happens? The lion pivots, and he didn't wait to hit the floor. The Bible says he jumped up and not only crushed him, he killed him and had lunch with him before he hit the ground. Daniel gets out. How? The king had one more move. And then when Jesus on the cross, and they put him in the borrowed tomb, and then they said, put these two Roman guards and guard it like he was a convict. No, he was Christ, but he wasn't a convict. I don't know who this is for. Maybe you're watching. Some people are dying at the altar of cults. Christ starts with a C. Cult starts with a C. Cult ends with a T. Christ ends with a T. But my friend, Christ is no cult. David Koresh, the wacko in Waco, Jim Jones, the cult leader, would give a fiery sermon and pass the Kool-Aid to the capacity crowd. And the irony is the crowd would drink the Kool-Aid and the crowd would die. And the cult leader would sneak out the back door to live one more day. Jesus the Christ prayed three times. He drank the bitter cup. And the leader died that the crowd could live another day. I'm going to stick with the one who stuck on the cross for you and I. He arose on the third day, and it's the only tourist attraction in the world where folks come from miles around to stand in line and look at nothing. You go to Buckingham Palace, you'll see something. You go to Graceland, you'll see something. You go to the White House, you wish you didn't see something. Can I get an amen? <laughs> They've asked, was Jesus a man or was Jesus God? He was both. Put him in a blender. He was Jesus, the son of the living God. Yeah. If he wasn't a man, who was that babe born in Bethlehem's barn? But if he wasn't God, why did 10,000 angels sing at that kid's birth? If he wasn't a man, who was that had hungered in the wilderness? But if he wasn't God, who fed 5,000 with the little lad's lunch? If he wasn't a man, who was that on the cross that cried, I, I thirst. But if he wasn't God, who told the woman at the well, drink from me, you'll never thirst again. If he wasn't a man, who was that dead for three days in Joseph Arimathea's tomb? But if he wasn't God, explain to me why that Jerusalem tourist attraction is empty tonight. See, the first time he came, he came in poverty. The next time he comes, he's coming in power. The first time he came, he was the rejected cornerstone. The next time he comes, he's the rock of all ages. The first time he came, he carried a cross. The next time he comes, he's carrying the whole government on his shoulders. The first time he came, he stood before Pontius Pilate. The next time he comes, Pontius Pilate is going to stand before him. And the first time he came, he came on a donkey. The next time he comes, he's on a winning stallion. He's not a wannabe. He's the word. He's the way. And he's the winner. Would you give Jesus one last Georgia round of applause? Amen. Real quick, real quick, look to your neighbor and say, tonight's your night. Look to your other neighbor and say, I'm his favorite. Amen. <laughs> If God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. All right. <laughs> Guys, I've learned real quick. If you ever have your back against the wall, we've all been there. You need to pray like never before. Say pray. pray. But you also got to sing his praises like never before. This is why I love Chris. Don't just worship him in the good. Worship him in the bad. Anyone can quote scripture and victory, but we serve him in the valley. In tough times, you'll either worship stress or worship the Savior, but you can't do both simultaneously. Friends, you can be consumed with anxiety or the Almighty, but not both. Depression needs to flee when you bow to the divine. And the next time, a lot of us are guilty trying to tell God how big our mountains are when we need to start telling our mountains how big our God is. Paul and Silas were God's men going to God's house. They were going to be a God's blessing. But instead of being, going, playing to church, they saw a woman who needed church in Christ. And they paused, they pivoted, and they pointed the way. And she went free. But they got thrown in prison. And here's where the rubber hits the road. 
Who you hang out with in a storm will determine if you'll go to the next level. Too many people have quit and boycotted church and they blame Christ for something he never or would do. Church may have hurt you, Christians may have hurt you, clergy may have failed you, but Christ will never fail you. And my friends, in these last days, you need to plug back into Christ and you need to get your rear back in gear and get it in here because I'm telling you, there's something left in the basement. And I'd rather be in a basement with the presence of God and anointing and be in a mega church and it acts like the odd house. Oh, we used to see people saved. I like what one preacher said. Humbly, if I was one of the pastors that hadn't seen someone saved in years, this is what I'd do. I'd climb in my old baptistry and in church with nobody looking. And I would not come out until my own tears filled up the tank. Yeah. I'm telling you, you won't see a lot of people saved until you start weeping over the lost. Have you ever lost sleep over the lost? I'm telling you, a black farmer told me a long time ago, Frank, you'll never see a harvest until you learn to water your crops. And guys, I'm telling you, a lot of us have turned in evangelism to attainment. We got the lights and the lasers, but the Lord is nowhere there. But it's okay to have both, but as long as he's still the star of the show. Paul and Silas, the preach and the praise and the Billy Graham and the George Beverly Shea, and their back is against the wall. And the one probably thought, well, you know what? I thought it was going to be on TBN. And I'm stuck by the toilet in prison. I didn't sign up for this. And they probably said, well, what should we do? And I like what one probably said through the lines. He said, I believe we need to do what we always do. He said, what's that? Well, I was doing the praising, you doing the preaching, and let's let it loose even in prison. I've had the honor to do chapel at Madison Square Garden. I've had the honor to lead Bible studies on Capitol Hill. I've seen some crazy stuff, but some of my best moments is what nobody on social media knows. The Bible says, don't always let your right hand know what your left hand doing. And if you think Madison Square Garden is one thing, I got a few secrets in heaven and it's going to be wild. And they're sitting in the back and they said, well, let's stick with the stuff in the storm. Anyone can stick with the Savior and success, but will you stick with the Savior and the storm? Say, I will. So she wasn't going to church. They brought church to her. And because they stuck with the stuff, they probably got up and they began to sing and preach they proclaimed in praise. And watch this. I want to read you this passage. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. Say pray. pray. And they sang praises, sang praises. Pray. And the prisoners heard them. They prayed, they praised, and the prisoners heard them. Four seconds ago, it made no sense. Now it makes perfect sense. Because they stuck with the stuff, she wasn't going to church. They brought church to her. They get thrown in the prison. It looked like a demotion in the natural, but it was a promotion in the supernatural. And because they stuck with the stuff and the storm, even in their cell, they prayed, they preached, they praised, and the prisoners heard them. The prisoners couldn't go to church, but because they stuck with the stuff, they brought church to the prisoners. Give him one last round of applause. <laughs> Revival broke out in the prison. And if they would have got bitter and canceled God, and I give up and he owes me. No, the only thing he owes me is hell. And the Bible says their praise, bam, the floodgates opened. And my wife's from El Salvador, but I can picture, hombre, hombre, hombre. they all ran out like Speedy Gonzalez. <laughs> and everyone ran out by Paul and Silas. And I asked God, why didn't they run? Number one, he said they weren't guilty. And everyone else was bound up like Houdini. And when everything hit, I said, God, why didn't they run? Number two, he said, because they were already free. You could be wrapped up like Houdini, but where the presence of the Lord is, there's liberty. But three, they didn't leave because the hat trick. She wasn't going to church. They brought church to her. The prisoners weren't going to church. They brought church to her. And watch this. The head cop, the sheriff, the jailer drew out his sword. I believe it glistened in the midnight sun, the moon, and he... Paul and Silas, this is where we need to go from Christianity 101 to Christianity 102. Will you be able to show God even to the people who hurt your feelings? Will you be able to demonstrate God to the people who never say they're sorry? Will you be able to demonstrate God even when all hell came against you? 
And when you realize all that he endured, we're not asked to do too much. And he was getting ready to commit himself because if you ever saw the Tom Cruise movie, The Last Samurai, if you dishonored or weren't on your post or you didn't have the goods, if you were dishonored and failed there, you were told you need to do the honorable thing and commit suicide. And that's a fact. And this guy was getting ready to commit suicide because he thought all these people fled on his watch. That's what the Bible says. And Paul and Silas screamed, stop, do yourself no harm. We're still here. And the same guys that went from rejecting him is now respecting him. The King James says, he says, sir, with a capital S, he said, sir, what must I do to be saved? See, the hat trick in hockey is three. And the irony is the woman that wasn't going to church, the prisoners, and now the top cop, all three of them came to Christ. And then he said, come home, led his whole family to Christ. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Guys, the king always has one more move. And I'm going to prophesy. God is not done. This place is just warming up. Man, what an honor it is to have been here on a Friday night. Probably less than 1% around the world is having church somewhere tonight. Can we give the basement and your pastors a loud round of applause? I'm going to land the plane here. When you're back against the wall and you're tempted to compromise, cheat, cut corners, or leave Christ out of the equation, we need Jesus more, not less. I've been told when a blacksmith is making a masterpiece in the making, he will hover over the lava-like fire. And it's a pain-taking process. That's why literally it's a dying art. And the heat is coming up like an inferno. And when he puts that blade in the making in the fire, if he leaves it in too long, he damages it. If he pulls it out premature, it's no good. But he knows it's finished when he lifts up and he can see his reflection in the masterpiece. And you know what? Thank God for the promotions you occasionally get. But I'm telling you, the church and the Christians that I know have survived more, not through promotion, but persecution. Yeah. Yeah. Persecution is really not your enemy. It's a friend you fail to appreciate. A valley is really just an upside down mountain. And when God decides to give you double for the trouble... You know, there's been time I thought my life was a rubber band, and I thought, my God, you pull me another inch, I'm going to snap. The beautiful thing, friends, he wasn't snapping me. He was shaping me to look like Jesus. And here's the word for everyone. The resistance on your life today will determine the distance you'll go for his glory tomorrow. Your adversity today will put you on his varsity tomorrow. And guys, I'm telling you, when you thought it was over, he said, I'm just warming up. I could tell you story after story where the king had one more move. Brian, who came all the way from South Carolina, him and his amazing wife, some of my heroes of the faith. I'm going to stop with this. I heard a story years ago. My dad served in Vietnam in 68, 69. There was a wealthy art collector in 67. In Philadelphia, are you ready for this? On the outskirts of Philly. He had a home in 67, was 12,200 square feet. I'll say that again, a 12,000 square foot colonial, pretty big house. The Corinthian columns, the electric gates, the oval driveway, the fountain, the yard, the Corinthian columns. It looked between the White House and Graceland, 42 foot ceiling. And I love the old Terra gone with the wind staircase. He had a six-car garage, and being in 67, he had a 67 vet, a 63 split window, 57 Mercedes gullwing door. But in addition to the house and the cars, the man collected paintings. He had a Picasso, a Michelangelo, and a Rembrandt. And in 67, conservatively, the paintings were worth $15 million in 67. He didn't have copies. He didn't have prints. He had the originals. His wife of 35 years, who was his love of his life, died of breast cancer. 
And him and his son used to walk around the mansion and they were always grateful and they knew they were blessed. They weren't arrogant and sometimes they would either walk the manicured lawns or sometimes they'd walk around and pinch themselves and said, God's been too good to me. And they actually knew the story and the backstory behind every priceless painting. But it was lonely when mom's gone and now it's just him and his only son. Well, at Thanksgiving of 67, his only son is called off to the Vietnam War. On Christmas Eve that same year, there was a knock on the door. And he sees a soldier, but all he saw was hands and a covered what looked like rectangle frame. In a brown paper bag, he saw padless shoes, and he slightly moved, and he could see some metals glistening in the sun. And he said, sir, you don't know me, but I know you. And I'm sorry to tell you that on behalf of a grateful country that your son was killed in battle. You raised him well. He was told to leave nobody behind. And he actually said, sir, the one that he rescued was me. He was running back. I was wounded. He grabbed me. He ran me to safety, but enemy fire put holes all in his back. But when we used to sit around at the campfire, he said he often talked about home, but he often talked about you, but he often talked about your respected love for art. He said, sir, can I come in? And the man in shock said, my house is yours. And he begins to weep like Niagara Falls. And he said, sir, I'm not much of a painting, but I've done my best to capture the personality of your son. I hope you would appreciate my effort. And the father ripped it open wide and he had never seen such precision and near perfection. And he began to weep because he just buried his wife and now he's burying his only son and poor as the man whose only wealth was in his wallet. But he was grateful and he had a 14 foot ladder and in front of the army's presence he had this massive foyer and he actually removed one of the priceless paintings and with a smile he hung the picture of the sun high for everybody to see it. And everybody that continued to come over it was no more about Picasso or Rembrandt or Michelangelo. It was the picture of his son that he was most proud of. He died a few months later and I've verified it. They said he died of a broken heart. Do you know it's medically proven today that some have died of a broken heart? They had a massive estate sale on Pennsylvania and folks came all over the eastern shoreboard. Just a view at the estate and maybe, just maybe, if you were fortunate, get one for your private collection. The house, the cars, the collection. Everybody's in tuxedos and the auctioneer came up and they put this picture of the sun up and they said, the sun, the sun, who will take the sun? And a couple people in the back said, it's from a novice, it's a nobody, it's painted by a loser, it ain't worth a dime. Let's move on so we can get with the big boys. And the auctioneer said, no, the son will go first. Who will give $100? Some clown in the back said, it ain't worth 10. But let's move it forward. He said, no, 100 who will give $200? And they're scoffing, a couple are cursing. The place is pandemonium. And they said, we drove 1,000 miles for the masters, not this novice. Can we move forward? And true story, there was an African-American in the back. He was the head gardener, and he said, I'll give you $20. And someone said, about time, it's probably $10 too much. Would anyone else give 30 since we can't even get 100 Going once, going twice, bam, sold. The African-American came down. Something was weird, tears in his eyes, and he said, uh, I'm going to cherish this. I was part land keeper here at the estate. I worked 15 years for the family. Never once did they make me feel inferior. They actually treated me like family. I began to fall in love with the wife who's now with the Lord. I was good friends with the father and the son. And I want to take the picture as a remembrance of the son and promptly hang it in my house. And people mocked him and said, well, let's get on with the show. And the auctioneer banged the gavel down and said, the auction is over. The place went wild and they said, excuse me. And he said, there was a secret stipulation. 
that would not be revealed at the owner's request. Whoever bought the painting of the son must have knew the son, loved the son, respected the son. Whoever got the picture of the son got the 12,000 square foot house, the six car garage, true story, the priceless paintings. John the Baptist said it. Tozer said it. Dale Moody said it. Spurgeon said it. Stanley said it. Jeremiah said it. Dr. Graham said it. Pastor Ron says it. R.C. Smith says it. Chris and the band go all over the country. And I'm still trying. The sun. The sun. Who will take the sun? Because whoever gets the king today gets the kingdom as a bonus. As a bonus. Give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask that you stand to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed. The word remnant comes before revival. And after the remnant, there is repentance. And after the remnant, revival. Repentance. There is no revival. But just like that little carpet, but just like that little carpet, you know what? What about if God wanted to use this remnant to be revival in all of Calvary? You know what's bigger than Bucky? You know what's bigger than Bucky? And I, get an and I love buckets. Can I get an amen? Bigger than the buckets. You know what's bigger than the buckets? Bible believing people. That is Bible believing people that I see here. You don't need 200 pumps. You don't need 200 pumps. We just need a few. We just need a few remnant. Plug into Jesus. We're gonna plug into Fill Jesus. Fill up that gospel tank. Fill up that gospel tank. And you're gonna touch on how who? You're gonna touch this county. And you're gonna touch. What about if God wants to use? What about if God wants to use a Saturday. church on Friday and Saturday? Underground to lift his name up. You don't need to be a mega guy. You don't need to be a mega church to make a mega difference. You guys have already passed the really test. But I really believe what we, believe what we get ready to do in the next chain reaction will be a chain reaction. I believe there's people online. I'm convinced there's a pastor watching tonight. And God bless him. He was getting ready to throw in the town. There's another one. There's another one. That's been convicted, and they haven't really been going out for so no shame. And there's no guilt, there's no shame. We love you, and you need to plug back in and preach it high on Sunday. I think some guys, I'm telling you, I think some people are taking notes from this group, from your group, plugging in, because you guys are plugging in when a lot of people have walked out. So if you're here today, so if you're here today and you know that you know that Jesus is the only way, raise your hand. If you're here today and you know that Jesus has been way too good to you, raise your other hand. If you're here today and you know America needs a fresh touch from God, say amen. If you're here today and you want to be part of the change, the solution, not the problem. If you want to graduate from mediocrity to ministry, say amen. If you believe God is dying to use you, say amen. And if you're here tonight and you know know that you're going to heaven when you die. But, say if, you're amen. Tonight and you're, but if you're here tonight and you're not sure, maybe you're watching online, I want to lead tonight you to your night. I want to lead you to Christ and heaven's a prayer way. If you like this after Christ, just repeat this after me. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner. The Savior. Jesus is the Savior. I heard that he died for the world. I've learned tonight, but I've learned tonight. Taste me. And the base just me. If it was just me that died for me, Jesus would have died for me. I don't want to go to a I don't want to go to a devil's hell. I believe, I believe your red blood on the cross paid the price for my sin. Paid the price for my sin. Save my soul. Save my soul. I repent from my sin when I die. Take me to heaven when I die. And on the third day, again, you rose again. Is dead. Muhammad is dead. Is dead. Confucius is dead. The Buddha is dead. The Catholic Church is dead. It's Jesus alive is alive and well. Save my soul when I die. Take me to heaven when I die. Jesus name. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer a minute, would you just raise your hand? Question number two. Praise God. Question number two. Today, if you're here today and you know we need Jesus, this is my last question. And this is my last question. I'm going to give an altar call right now. If you have. If you have running on it, a friend who's running on it, who needs Jesus, who has needs more Jesus, days than dollars, who has more days than dollars, than you, the maybe a health on the issue, rocks, the relationship on someone the rise, dared to someone dared to care to share Jesus with I'm you. Ask that maybe, 
I'm going to ask that you would stay in the gap and stay. You would stand in the gap and stay praying for them. And pray for them. Or stand. You can kneel or stand. Telling you. And guys, I would tell you today could be a ripple effect. What's done today could be a ripple effect. If you're here today and say, Frank, I, if you're here today and say, Frank, I am saved your soul, but pray for me. Jesus is on more cylinders for Jesus when he calls you. that you would just be bold enough to raise your hand. just be bold enough to raise your hand. If God made you an eight cylinder car, please don't be consent running on four cylinders when he calls you. All cylinders. Be on all cylinders. If you believe, if you believe, way, Jesus is the only way. He needs a fresh step. If you have a friend who needs a fresh step, up your game for Christ. If you want to step up for games for Christ, if you want to pray for another soul, if you want to pray to help link arms with this great church, I'm going to ask you to come forward at the count. I'm going to ask you to come forward at the count of three. This should be everyone. This is not this should be everyone. This is not manipulation, but I believe in motivation. Playing it safe in the seat. Playing it safe in the seat. I'm an I'm an devil. I want you to come all a bunch of cell phones. Imagine you're all a bunch of cell phones. And the altar alters your situation here. And there's a victory. Here, just you gotta consider this is the gold line. line. You gotta cross like gold away the power and pretend like this is the power. You have to plug it in to Jesus. Crook here straight to make cloud crook it here straight. But we'll go out and clear and we'll go from losing with the Lord to leading. I'm gonna count to three. If you have a friend to three, if you have a friend who needs to get the weight of the world on your shoulders, you have the weight of the world on your shoulders. If you want to stay for America or you want to step up again, game, I'm gonna ask you to begin to come, make it easier for the person behind you. And you come and let God shake this Calhoun, county, this and county, country, and the country.
Listen real quick. Thank you guys for coming. If you want to thank you guys for coming, if you're praying, just stay where you're at. Half of the pastors, listen on behalf of the pastors in this house. We want to thank you for coming. Be blessed. We will see you next.